Jonathan Payne is with us from Show Me Cannabis Executive Director. Jason Grolin with us, Franklin County Sheriff's Department. Uh, tonight, the Ethical Society, 7 o'clock. They're going to have a debate on the legalization of cannabis in the state of Missouri. John Payne, we'll start with you. Where are we in this process? Um, are, we, are you going to make another run at it? Are you going to try and get it through the legislature? Are you going to try another statewide petition? Where are we? Uh, yeah, we're definitely going to make another run at it. Uh, the question is, is whether that's going to be in 2014 or 2016. Uh, so we've turned in some initiatives to the Secretary of State's office, and we're going to get ballot language back on that. Uh, and then we'll do polling on that ballot language, and that'll determine whether we move forward in 2014 or, you know, sort of shelve it and wait till 2016. What are you hearing from the elected officials and leaders in the community about this? Well, you know, uh, a lot of elected officials, uh, elected officials often like to lead from behind. Uh, and so uh, a lot of them don't really want to discuss it. Uh, but uh, I, I do, when I go down to Jefferson City, I talk to some of them in private, and they'll tell me, oh, well, I agree with you, but, uh, you know, my constituents aren't there yet. Uh, and then I, I think there's actually kind of a disconnect between uh, the, the constituents and the legislators because the constituents are afraid to speak out about it. Uh, and so the legislator thinks that they don't. Uh, that they're all, uh, you know, ardent prohibitionists when, in fact, uh, that's not the case. What are we seeing from Colorado? In January 1, you can be able to walk into a store in Colorado and buy recreational marijuana. And as a non-resident, you can buy, I believe, up to a quarter of an ounce a day, right? Yes, that is correct. Uh, I will say, though, that it's, uh, uh, you know, some of the stores are, it's taking a little while to get the regulatory paperwork uh, taken care of. Uh, so it's not going to be like uh, there are just tons of stores operating on January 1. But nonetheless, yes, uh, legally there will be some of them operating. Uh, and so uh, it's a little preliminary right now to uh, know a whole lot uh, because, you know, most of the numbers that come out of uh, come out come out on an annual basis. Right. And so we don't really know, like, what's going on with, uh, uh, say, traffic deaths or with uh, – uh, with teen use rates, but those uh, those numbers will be coming out fairly soon, and I'm uh, I'm excited to look at them. Jason Grellner, uh, legalizing marijuana. You must get asked that question quite often in your job. We do. We we talk about it not only as a part of the job. We talk about it as part of drug court programs. We talk about it as part of rehabilitation programs. It's a topic that circulates uh, quite often. And your thoughts? My thoughts are that we. Uh, have to look out for the kids. You know, I know that John Payne and Show Me Cannabis constantly say we don't want it with kids. Uh, you know, we're going to do everything we can to keep it out of the hands of kids. When you decriminalize, legalize a substance, you're basically saying it's safe. And this isn't a safe product. And what w kids are going to hear is safe. And what they're going to see under the legislation that I've read that they've put forward is the ability to grow it in your own home, uh, the ability uh, to have up to 72 ounces, four ounces of raw materials, you know. In uh, Colorado, foods. they're allowed, I think, to grow six plants. Missouri, in, in some of the legislation. Now, let me tell you, there's nine or ten different things brought forward that are at the Secretary of State's office. I think there's actually 16 now. 16. <laughs> so 16 different bills that are going to work and, their way through? Uh, the the initiative drafts, uh, they uh, they have slight different variations because uh, we want to see what the uh, the differences uh, in polling results would be for uh, some of the small changes. Gotcha. To them. And, and these are 16, many of these initiatives are to change our Constitution. This, these aren't legal changes as most people would think of right. going through the legislature. This is going to become a part of our Constitution so that they can't be touched by the legislature in the future. Mm -hmm. You've you've been on the front lines. You've seen the devastation of the drugs. Um, it goes back to the prohibition argument. If you legalize, when, when alcohol was illegal, wasn't there more crime on the streets? Wasn't there more devastation? Wasn't it unregulated to the point where anybody could, could get their hands on it? Today, Jason Grellner, is it not true that a 16-year-old high school kid, it's easier to get a marijuana joint than it is to get a six-pack of beer. No, it's not. And no matter what people say, that's not true. And when you compare th cannabis to alcohol and cigarettes, we're comparing it to two products that kill over a half a million citizens a year. So shouldn't we really be talking about what we can do about cigarettes and alcohol to help our society and save the lives of half a million people? Why are we going to introduce another product that is going to harm the health? And we know that. We know that for sure from the studies that are out there already, and they're only preliminary. We haven't delved deep in it. We don't have years of studies to look at. But the studies we're already seeing regarding uh, cognitive abilities in the brain, uh, short-term mem short memory loss, um, schizophrenia and, and uh, other 
mental diseases and disorders. Um, and IQ loss, IQ loss of if youth start too early with marijuana of eight points can drop somebody from the 50th percentile to the 30th percentile. And then these individuals are going to grow up uh, to have children of their own and try to parent now being in the 30th percentile of IQ. Why in the world are we going to bring forth another product that harms human beings when we haven't figured out how to fix alcohol and cigarettes, and that's all anybody wants to compare it to? John? Uh, well, one, first of all, I would say that it's not, uh, we're not bringing forth a new product. The product is here, uh, and what we're doing now isn't stopping anyone from using it. Uh, you know, uh, we've actually had a great deal of success in battling the harms of alcohol and tobacco with regulation, taxation, and education. Uh, the rate of cigarette smoking has dropped by over half since the 1960s, uh, and now uh, high school seniors are more likely to use cannabis than to smoke cigarettes. Well, and that's because after the court cases regarding cigarette smoking that went on in the 80s, the manufacturers were called to the table and said, shame on you, you're marketing to children, uh, you're making sure that you start with the youth smoking so because so many people are going to die if you you have to start young because they're going to shorten their lives by 30 years. Um, and so it's not as easy. You know, prohibition does work. The highest number of users in the United States was in about 1974 when nearly 15 percent of Americans were using some sort of illegal substance, and the main part of that was marijuana. Those numbers dropped during the Reagan era to less than 7 percent. It was about 6.6 .6 to 6.8 percent during the Just Say No campaign. When did they start to come back up again? 1996, when states like California and people like Normal and the Marijuana Project started talking about marijuana as medicine. And we've already seen what medicine can do. We see that with prescription drug abuse, one of the most regulated industries that we have, regulated from the minute it's manufactured all the way through the doctors and the pharmacists. We've seen what regulations do. I would uh, say that, you know, in the 1970s, it was still prohibited. In fact, the laws were even more stringent. Uh, the laws have moved uh, in a more lenient direction since the 1970s. But, yes, the, the peak of drug use in this country occurred when uh, you could actually, every you know, it was still a felony uh, to even possess any amount of marijuana in many states at that time. Uh, so, now, granted, the number of arrests did rise pretty dramatically, but that happened in the 90s, not in the 80s. Uh, and drug use actually ticked up at the same time that the arrest rate did. Uh, so, I, I think uh, the evidence is pretty clear that prohibition is not having much of an effect. Uh, so, I, I think, uh, and actually, the, the people that I think you are deterring uh, aren't so much deterred by prohibition as probably uh, people that have, uh, are getting drug tested. I think you're mostly deterring people that are uh, adults and have jobs. You know, because that, kids and adults alike both say in surveys the number one reason that they don't use marijuana and illegal drugs is because it's illegal. So when you take away the illegal nature, then you're taking away their number one reason to say no. So use is going to climb. We already see that in adults it's 7%, and as you've pointed out, in some parts of the country among youth it's 21%. One of those areas being Colorado that's at 26% above the national average actually, actually, they were below the national average last year. Colorado was below the national average. Not the yeah. it, not the paperwork that I have from Colorado. Not in Boulder. Yeah, <laughs> maybe not in Boulder. I, I don't I don't know specifically about specific cities, but let's let medical marijuana is interesting. Um, there is a, a there is a um, uh, an alderman in uh, St. Peter's who is battling the effects of cancer, and um, has a hard time eating, and is afraid he might starve to death. And his doctor said, you know what, do what you have to do, smoke a little marijuana, get get your appetite back. He was arrested and uh, was given a summons for medical marijuana. Don't you think, Jason, that's a little too far? And if that's if his doctor and him agree that smoking marijuana helps him eat and that combats the effects of, of whatever treatment in his cancer, shouldn't he be allowed to do that? There's a lot of intricacies in medical marijuana. And in, in that instance right there, does anybody want to take medicine or whatever anybody wants to call medicine away from somebody that's in a dying state? Certainly not. But when you look at what medical marijuana really is in the United States, above 90% of the medical marijuana users in the, in the United States, among the 17 or 20 states that have medical marijuana, are white males between the ages of 25 and 35 with no known disease state, a history of criminal activity, and a history of drug abuse. It's not those people. Those people are, are the oddities. Or few and far between. Far, few and far between. Right. Now, to say that, He's battling cancer already. We know that the number of carcinogens and hydrocarbons in marijuana smoke is higher than those in cigarette smoke. 
So if we're curing him of one thing but killing him of another, what are we doing? Why are we not allowing this drug to go through the normal chains of the FDA? We already have three approved marijuana drugs on the market, including a THC drug, which is supposed to help with appetite, that you can take as a pill form and not smoke. We have four more that are going through uh, the last conditions of the FDA. In what world, and, and where in the United States history, have we ever legislated medicine without going through the FDA's process of making sure that it's safe, that the dosage is secure, uh, that the synergistic effects with other medicines are taken care of? Well, I would say the reason that, that is that the case is because the DEA holds it as a Schedule One substance. So basically, the federal government has outlawed research on it. Really, you can because only, they gave you can out only over three thousand permits last year for doctors to work on the Schedule One drug. Yeah, get permits. It's a very time-consuming process, and the National uh, Institute on Drug Abuse is the one who has to approve them, and they are most likely to approve uh, studies that look at the harms of cannabis as opposed to potential medical benefits. Uh, Sanjay Gupta, in his uh, special on, uh, on marijuana that aired on CNN back in August, uh, had a whole section on how the, uh, the research is currently skewed by the federal funding and control of, uh, of, of it being that, a Schedule one substance. And that's his subjective thought on the matter. Well, but he is a medical doctor. At, well, but when you look at the medications that are coming through the FDA and, and following through with that process, we're getting safe products that have medical usefulness in the same way uh, that we do with opium. You don't see people smoking raw opium as medicine. What we see is semi-synthetics of the opium plant and derivatives of the opium plant that have gone through testing to make sure that they're not harmful to the patients. Uh, and, and that are being dispensed. That is Jason Grellner, John Payne. Tonight they're going to speak at the Ethical Society. We will leave some of the powder in the gun, if you will, for tonight. But, Jason, before we let you go, uh, we keep getting calls from LEAP, which is Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. There are a bunch of uh, everyone who's in the front lines of the drug war on drugs, whether it's prosecutors, people like you, sheriffs, um, uh, lawyers, uh, law enforcement, everybody's involved, and they making a push to legalize marijuana, saying the war on drugs is a failure. What do you say to your uh, people like that? Any profession in this country is made up of, of the members of its society. I don't care if you're talking about doctors, firefighters, police officers, religious faculty. I don't who it, care who it is. So if a certain percentage of the United States, and I'm going to tell you it's a very small percentage of the United States, is in favor of legalizing uh, marijuana, then there's going to be a certain sector of our uh, profession that's in favor of legalizing. I'm sure there's a certain sector of doctors, a certain sector of ambulance personnel, firefighters, whoever it may be that's in right. favor of it. But they're not the main body of law enforcement. And they're not the individuals uh, that are speaking for law enforcement. They're speaking for themselves. I can tell you that the National Narcotics Officers Association, uh, that the Police Chiefs Association, the Sheriff's, the National Sheriff's Association all came out against Eric Holder recently um, with his complete disregard of federal law and how he's going uh, to uh, pursue uh, legal ramifications in the state of Colorado uh, criminally and Washington state. Uh, they all came out against him for saying he's not going to enforce uh, state law or federal law. When in the world did the executive branch decide that they could overrule both the judicial and the legislative branch? That's Jason Groner. More tonight, 7 o'clock, Ethical Society of St. Louis. Be one of the first 420. You'll get a seat. Otherwise, you'll be uh, reading it in the notes the next day. John Payne, Show Me Cannabis. Thank you very much for coming in. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, that's Jason Groner, Franklin County Sheriff's Department. Jason, be safe out there, and Merry Christmas to you and yours. Merry Christmas to you and yours, too. 936 here, Big 550 KTRS. Want to get a